Excellent. Um, so, uh, so now we'll we'll ask Graham Ogle to uh, come and talk to us, uh, and because he's been popping up and down, you know Graham, but um, you may not know his background. So Graham comes from a uh, a background working in in agriculture, uh, overseeing farms, and then working as a farm consultant, uh, and then he joined Ag Research at Fota Fota Research Centre, uh, where he worked in the farm systems team along myself and Paul Marshall and many others working on Stockpole, which became FarmMax. Uh, and then he had a stint managing FarmMax uh, uh, and now works in farm systems in Rosia. So, Graham. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I also fitted in a couple of years uh, modelling rabbit numbers in central Otago, <laughs> which got me interested in modelling, uh, to be fair. Right. So what I thought I'd do is I'd, I, I'll... I'm going to give you a presentation that has a few um, mind experiments in it, just to get you thinking. So I've got some notes on those mind experiments. Right, so um, what I'd like to talk about is pasture growth forecasting, uh, are we there yet? Um, I'm not sure I come to a conclusion, but uh, uh, I'll go through some of the issues that we have um, as we go through. Right, uh, I think um, these glasses, I, I'm doing a Todd Muller. But, um, right, I, I think why I'm so excited about pasture modelling um, or anything in the space is that we basically have really good systems here that eat cheap grass as it's growing. Uh, I didn't realise how much of a benefit that was until I started travelling overseas and seeing people planting crops and harvesting them and feeding them out and all the times I'd gone around the paddock and see, just to get their cows fed, uh, all, all 30 of them. Um, New Zealand has, has scale. Uh, it means that farmers can uh, work full time on the farm and I think that's a really big significant thing. Uh, and it mean, our farms also make a profit. We don't have to rely on a cheque from the government, and it means those farmers can make decisions about products that add value to their viable businesses. Uh, look, New Zealand has great modelling heritage. When we look at uh, products like Overseer, the genetic engines that um, LIC, CRV, DGAD uh, have, uh, beef and lamb genetics, um, farm max, and of course the pasture growth forecaster. These, these models, I think, touch nearly every New Zealand farmer, whether they know it or not. I, I came across some good research the other day. I was talking to uh, Pierre Burks about it, because uh, he wrote it, uh, along with his uh, uh, co-authors. What, what I liked about this research, and it's on the grey line at the top, is it looked and said, what if I have imperfect knowledge? That means I have a error of 15% on my pasture estimates. How much more can I make compared to a farmer who has no knowledge, probably no metrics for calculating what's in the paddock and follows the grass as it grows around the farm? It's obvious that you grow the longest paddock and you keep going around and you make some decisions about rotation and, and a lot of farmers operate in that manner and some farmers do it exceptionally well um, and that kind of keeps it going I think. But if I put another line in there and say the, the pasture growth forecaster is a pan pastoral service so it's providing estimates to sheep and beef farmers. Um, what's the value to sheep and beef farmers compared with dairy farmers. So if we look on the top line, um, there was a value from going from uh, no knowledge to imperfect knowledge of about $380 a hectare, which is about an increase of 13%. Um, perfect knowledge took that to $500 a hectare. And if I just apply that to sheep and beef, um, we see that the increase in the dairy sector was only 7.5% increase in pasture production. 
But in the sheep and beef systems, that increase is going to be a lot more. So I've conservatively put 15% on that. And anyone who's, who drives around and looks around sheep and beef farms and thinks that uh, we're doing anywhere near what the dairy industry is doing in feed allocation and feed assessment, 15% um, might be a bit modest. But what would, it, what would it end up in value if we converted that into revenue? Um, it would be about a $240 increase in revenue, and it would be an increase of 47%. So, so there's real value in sheep and beef, and there is a good baseline value in dairy. So what, what information is required for this uh, perfect knowledge? I think our decision making is really about how best to match paddock by paddock grazing with the animals that are available. That's sort of across all industries. What, what would give us perfect knowledge? Well, I would say that there's two things. One would be timely, effortless, accurate biomass estimates for each paddock. And when people, when I used to say this a couple of years ago, people would go, timeless, timely, effortless. Boy, that sounds like a bit of a dream, Graham. Um, we'll also need effortless, accurate pasture growth rate predictions for each paddock. I'd like to um, introduce a concept here that really we're all, every farmer is playing a pastoral game, whether they know it or not. And if I'm, I want to have this thought experiment with you that you have 60 days as a farmer, perfect knowledge. Now it's abstracted knowledge, you don't need to know how many worms there are in the paddock, you just need abstracted knowledge that will fit with the kind of things you need to plan. And the two things there are the biomass in the paddock, each paddock, and the predicted pasture cover, uh, growth rates. With that we can do a lot of planning. I've worked as a farm consultant for many years, so I, even though I work for Azia, I also am a part-time consultant. And I'm always amazed at how big the chips are that the farmers are playing with when they're making these two monthly decisions. They're $10,000 chips. Um, can I finish 1,500 extra lambs? Well, that's a $75,000 opportunity. If the next two weeks are dry, what decisions shall I make with the milking herd? Now I don't do a lot of, haven't done much in dairy, but I would have thought that is where the money's made. Indeed, the reason I'm really interested in this is this is where the money is made. There is nowhere else. I've never met a farmer who's in the top 5% who just doesn't have very good feed planning. Those two things don't kind of uh, meet, you know. So why aren't we just making decisions all the time, seeing it's valuable? Um, I think the frequency with which you can make decisions depends a bit on the farm system, the complexity of the farm system, how many people are involved, um, is it a corporate structure? Um, and on farm, is there simply the infrastructure to get the information you need and make the decisions? If you've got five paddocks, you're not really going to make a big decision on grazing rotations of the mobs. So every cycle has a real cost to it. And I think the biggest cost uh, I see with farmers that I've worked with is how much energy it takes to make that decision, get it all out to all of the staff, and actually implement what you need to do to change things. It just takes a certain amount of energy. Those farms that can react really quickly, it doesn't take much energy. They, they can do it quite quickly. They just need to tell the head somebody what, what's going on, and the decisions are made quite quickly, effortlessly. And of course, they can, 
they can support a greater frequency of decision making. So if we're to look at the decision making cycle as one of the key targets here, um, what does that mean? So I, I sat down and I, I played with this, I had a lot of fun with it actually. Um, to explain this graph, on the bottom here is, uh, on the x-axis, is the interval with which we have perfect knowledge. So if at any particular time I had five days, I'm down there. So let's look at the extremes. Let's look it up here. If I had no knowledge of what's going to happen, like this afternoon it could be a tropical cyclone, or it could be a continuation of the 100-day drought I'm in, I don't know. I've got no idea. And I don't know how much pasture's out there. The line doesn't actually hit the y-axis because there's no point in doing any decisions. It's actually an infinity problem. That you, there's just no point. Whereas if I had 60 days of accurate information, and it's just, it would just work with me on this thought experiment. What would I do? I'd sit down, because of the decision-making cycle and the effort involved, I'd just sit down and make all my plans for the next 60 days, and then in 60 days' time I'd do it again. And I'd probably have some quite complex software that enabled me to get all the factors and take them into account, something like FarmMax that would allow me to do that plan. So on the y-axis is the number of decision-making cycles. If we can see 15 days ahead, we've captured actually 93% of the reduction in decision-making cycles that we're going to get for, for two months. That surprised me. It means that if we can get fortnightly reasonably accurate or very accurate predictions of biomass and predicted growth, then we're 93% solve this frequency of decision-making issue that farmers will tell you is a really big issue. So if you look at the technologies, the pasture growth forecaster, as it's used in space, helps the measurement technology. It's not used as a prediction technology of what's going to happen from here on. It's a measurement improvement. But of course models, they work with abstracted data. Our mo growth model works with the data that's supplied by NIWA. So actually, it doesn't matter whether it's in the future or in the past, as long as that abstracted data is consistent, it could be a future prediction or it could be a prediction about past things to help accuracy. Models don't really understand real time. That's quite, that's quite beneficial because you can use a model that's doing a good job at predicting the covers for space to predict into the future. So I want to talk a bit, a bit about improving the accuracy of models. Um, one of the um, rules of thumb on a dairy farm, and I'm sure it's every bit the same on a sheep and beef farm, is that the poorest and the best paddock uh, is about 100% variation on the same soil type, same resource base. A paddock might have been pugged badly last winter or something. You know, there's a lot of reasons why. And I'll also talk a bit about our measurement uh, accuracy is only 15%. So let's um, get on with our thought experiment. So what, how do we cope with this in, indeed in space uh, and uh, in the, our commercial service? So what I've got here is we, we use a window into the pasture growth forecaster to run data sets that we come up with, that we get our hands on. This is a data set on, on the east coast. And when we run, run the model, it runs with its what we call the raw parameters, unadjusted, and it's giving us this very poor fit. So 
what we do is we pull some parameters aside, the ones we think are particularly effective, like the model's abstracted knowledge of fertility, um, and we run it through a learning algorithm that looks at lots of different possibilities of the parameters. And then the bottom graph there is a, what's happened is the learning algorithm has decided that that soil must be deeper than what we put in as our initial parameters because it didn't react uh, to dryness at that soil depth. So as we increase the soil depth, it went, yeah, well, you're going to get closer. And then the other thing we had to increase was the fertility of the site, and we got a very good fit. I want to talk about just how much data we have and how, how good it is. So this graph, uh, I tried to get slide animations working so I could show it bit by bit, but there were some technical issues. So I'm going to give it to you all at once. Right, so in our thought experiment, imagine that the green line is the actual pasture growth, right? And we are trying to measure that pasture growth. So measurement of pasture growth, there is nothing, by the way, that measures pasture growth. You don't, it would be good if you had a little tool and you pointed it at the pasture and it said it's growing to, uh, currently at 60 kilograms of dry matter a day. But it's, it is a derived figure. So every data point has two errors in it. That is the, the starting figure and the end figure. And if you add 15% to the bo both of those, the error is not too bad if, it's, if both measurements are consistently too high or too low. But the problem comes when you have a, a, a low and a high or a high and a low. So if we estimated that our residual at start, or our starting cover was too high when it was actually lower, and then had a low harvest figure, then the amount we harvest is significantly less. It's not 15% less. It's a lot more than that. It's double that. The worst of those two could possibly be 30% <coughs> above and below. So what it means here is, just shown by those grey lines, for our June pasture growth, the data that we actually observed, the data, no, the data we observed, not, not the actual data, is some, can give us a reading somewhere between 2 kilograms per day or 38 kilograms per day for June. That's the data. That's the limitation of the accuracy. Now, not all data is going to be like that, uh, and I'm sure that there'd be statistical ways of really attacking this problem. The issue is um, we don't usually get 50 years of pasture harvest data to do a good statistical approach on. Three years is, is a lot of a lot of time in a pasture growth experiment. Everyone's sick of it after three years. And um, that, that would be the bare minimum to start statistically looking at this er these errors. The issue we have is we get these small windows to validate our growth model, and every data point is important. We want to know why the model's not going up to that point. Why are we not getting that growth up there that the observed growth told us it was going we should be getting. So the blue line is just high, low, high, low, high, low, right? That's what measured data could be telling you against what we probably think the real growth rate is in the background. OK, there's going to be a bit of bouncing around, but the issue we have is, in two parts here, the model is going down when we think the growth should be going up. So when, we have, when we've only got one or two years of data, we look at those and we think, that doesn't look right. So our approach has been to apply a bit of black magic to that, uh, the dark magic, they call it. And uh, we've been working on that to try and remove errors that look 
poor and see if it, we get better future predictions by taking certain points out. It's cyclical. If you don't have good data to validate it against, you get no further ahead. What we really need is good longitudinal data that has accurate trim cut measurements fortnightly. Here's my wish list, by the way. Um, pasture composition. We really need to understand co pasture composition. Climate data on the site, not the nearest site. We want to know if a spring rainfall shower came through and dropped 20 mils on your place but nowhere else. We want that rainfall in there in our model, not floating around, because it just creates a very loose interpretation of what we think actually happened. Soil moisture and soil temperature, why not? Site plant available water, measure the soil, work out how much water it actually would hold. Soil fertility, slope and aspect. Now in New Zealand, the number of sites that meet that requirement is zero. In a pastoral industry, where we make all our money out of pasture. The greatest margin we make is eating fresh pasture as it grows. And our data set for something like this is zero. We've done, uh, I, I just look at it and think we're, we've really achieved quite a lot given the data sources that we have, really. Um, I'm not here to plug away at people particularly about data sources, but I just see it as a huge opportunity to have this good uh, lateral, um, longitudinal, they call it in the medical industry, longitudinal knowledge. And if we're talking about production, there's a whole lot of things there we'd like to know longitudinally about the environment as well. So I think there's a holy grail out there. I think when we hit that holy grail, farmers are just going to say, look, just give me a system that uses that data and gives me a pasture grazing plan and I'll pass that on to the staff. It'll be as simple as that. And that grazing plan, if we do our job right, will be better than anything they could have come up with. And it'll give them consistency of making decisions. For a two month period, what do we need? I've got a five minute sign here. Right. You, you need enough and accurate, accurate enough information for these farms who are actually playing this pasture game. They are playing the game even if they don't think they're playing it. They're probably losing it, but we need to provide them with that information to play the game. That's our role. That's what we see uh, in Razia. That, that's what they want. That's what they need. That's where the money's at. We think this 14-day period uh, for good, accurate information on what's actually on farm and what's going to grow is realistic. And if we hit that, the decision-making cycle uh, is about at its shortest. Uh, we could look. I think you get you need to make four decision-making cycles at 60 days. Um, if you want to get that down to two decision-making cycles you need nearly 30 days of reliable, accurate information, which I don't think we're, is going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, I'm not sure it's even technically possible. Most farmers have no metrics for pastures. They don't talk in a metric that the computers understand. When I started consulting, farmers would tell me there's a, a fresh green pick up in those back paddocks. And I'd look at my spreadsheet model and I'd think, how do I translate that? And the fresh green pick was usually code for not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I think when, when we get the results good enough and we can pr present them as we're doing with space, the innovative ways of engaging with farmers will come along. People who have got lots of imagination in the user interface side of it 
and how they want to engage with farmers. It's just going to happen. Might take longer than we want, but what they need is good. It's high risk put it, uh, creating those products. If I was a, going to just go out and create something for some farmers and see how it would go, I'm probably up for half a million to spend on the user interface and the database and the customer management system. Um, I've got very little idea whether it's going to be successful. It's actually a reasonably small market. So the one thing I would need to know as a supplier or, or investing in that product is, can you give me good data so I don't have to battle that front while I'm doing all these? And we see that as our role, providing good data that people can go, yeah, I can reliably build on this something innovative to farmers. And uh, I'd like to point out that good models last a long time. The FarmMax model, built uh, by Dave McCall back in 1984, it's there today, and it's still doing a big job for the industry. So I'll leave you with an equation there that I think has uh, lasted well, although I understand that it's not, not quite the top of the, uh, the science, uh, quantum, the uh, cosmology science that uh, is there today. Um, and lastly, uh, I'd like to thank um, the contributors to the space um, to, uh, technology. Um, so Dairy NZ and MPI used uh, uh, joint funding. Uh, Beef and Lamb helped with the development of the websites. And of course Niwa is the supplier of the data and they will be investing their money in getting that to be more accurate over time. Thank you. Now, um, I'm also the facilitator, so I'd better check how I'm going. Um, I think we've run out of time. Yeah. Okay.